Hey Metalheads, you like tattoos? Of course you do. If you're in the Louisville, Kentucky area, come on over the bridge to Clarksville, Indiana and get you some ink done at Ageless Art. If ink isn't your thing, they have a piercing studio as well. Visit agelessartclarksville.com to see some frequently asked questions, meet the staff. The shop is open Monday through Thursday, 12 to 8 p.m., Saturdays, 12 to 10 p.m., and Sundays, 12 to 6 p.m., all appointment-only spots. You can set up your appointments by phone at 812-283-1793 or email piercing at gmail.com and someone will get you set up for your first or your next tattoo or piercing. Hey, Metalheads, after going to a Rager, what's your ultimate go-to? Mine is totally pizza. So when Overload is playing or I'm promoting the Metal Forge Live showcases or the big goddamn metal show, I go to Pizza Donisi. Pizza Donisi is gourmet artisan pizza from right here in Louisville, Kentucky. It features things like the pizza of the month, the sandwiches, and also vegetarian and vegan options, which is so totally fucking cool for all, all of it's It's awesome pizza. You definitely want to go. Hey, and also, from time to time, they do cannolis. Oh, so fucking good. You know what they said, man. Leave the gun, take the cannoli. Yeah, just like that in Godfather. They're located right next to the Mag Bar at 1396 South 2nd Street. So either stop in or call in at 502-213-0488. They're open till midnight. The Witching Hour. Heineken? Fuck that shit! Pax Blue Ribbon! Hey, Metalheads, you all hear me talk about Magbar all the time. It is the home to the Metal Forge Live showcases and is an integral stop in the ultimate underground metal tour schedule. They obviously feature live music, but the Magbar also has daily specials like Pint and Slice Night on Tuesdays with Pizza Donisi. But they also do Bring Your Own Vinyl on Thursdays with DJ Kent Jackson. And Finer Things Sundays. Located right next to Pizza Donisi at 1398 South 2nd Street. Open 3 p.m. to 4 a.m. seven days a week. Get your asses out to the Mag Bar. Rock out. For 45 years in keeping Louisville weird, Electric Ladyland has been there for all your eccentricities. While they do offer the best smoking supplies out on the market today, there's a whole lot more to check out. From ashtrays and blacklight posters, to records, incense and burners, and items to stock your metaphysical supply. They're open from 10 to 10, seven days a week. Located at 2325 Bardstown Road in Louisville, Kentucky, and at electricladyland420.com. Roll out. The year was 1979, and all the world was caught up in disco and Star Wars. But in Louisville, something was happening. A young entrepreneur named Ben had a vision to be the best record store in all of the city. Fast forward to 2023, and Better Days Records is still going strong. Still, after all these years, owned by the same guy. We have had some trips and falls along the way, but so does life, and Better Days is here to stay. With two awesome locations at 921 Barrett Avenue and at 2600 West Broadway, better days are surely in your future. In 
a broken wasteland I come to my fire And place your blood and steel Upon my fire What's going on, Metalheads? Thank you all for tuning in to this week's episode of The Metal Forge. Hopefully, everybody is out kicking ass in this summer heat. Good Lord, is it hot out there this year. Ugh. So anyways, like I have a little bit of a conundrum this week. So I have felt like ass all week long. So I'm going to keep it kind of short and kind of sweet today. So I do have a few things I want to mention uh, but first, you know, if listen to your fucking tattoo artist. And I, you know, I try to, and I do what they tell me to do, but I just have a body that sucks sometimes and tells me, hey, fuck you, stop getting tattoos, right? So I've been fighting uh, that infection all week, so fuck that shit. Uh, because of the heat and all of the garbage and uh, that, you know, that we all go through every day and shit. So I'm not going to, like, linger too much on that or, or anything else because Guillermo Miranda from the band Dieth is here and this is the Dieth proper episode because you know back in February we had David Ellison here in the Metal Forge who is the bass player for the band Dieth but it's really Guillermo's uh, like baby really so we're going to talk to him and we're going to see how he what he came up with with the band Dieth and how they got started. You know, not just when uh, David came back in and, or came in and said, hey, I think I want to do that. So let's check in with him here in just a minute. But before we do, um, yeah. So did you see the post earlier in the week? The Metal Forge shirts are available. Uh, the lovely Ashley Vega, Mercury Fatale. Uh, was the first model for the shirts and actually you know she's super badass uh, she is in the band Promise of Plague who is also on the Metal Forge compilation CD that I have coming out at the end of this month so go to officialoverload.com or officialoverload.bandcamp.com to get your Metal Forge wares. The CD coming out, uh, it starts shipping on the 31st of July, and the shirts will start shipping, I believe, on uh, on Monday. Monday, Monday, Monday. Uh, wow, it's it's insane. So uh, it's a 20 buck shirt, um, and the CD's a $10 CD, so go, go support these bands. Go support the Metal Forge. Uh, I appreciate all of your listens. And y'all kick ass, and let's go ahead and get into this week's episode with, with Guillermo Miranda from the band Dieth, and just recently releasing the album To Hell and Back. We're going to play Don't Get Mad, Get Even. Don't Get Mad, Get Even.
Maniacs. This week, we are back, and this is kind of like getting the band on proper. Okay, now, back in February, you all remember Dave Ellison was on the show promoting Kings of Thrash and Dieth and all of his other projects, but today, we actually have, is it, let me, let me see, is it Guillermo? Yeah, Guillermo, actually, Guillermo is the, is the Portuguese version for Guillermo or Guillaume Wilhelm. <laughs> nice. So yeah, so call me or whatever. You so I, I I was kind of close. However you can pronounce it, you know. <laughs> See, you know, being in America, you know, we don't have that name come up a lot. You know, we got a lot of mics and bills and and shit like that. But you know, uh, Guillermo, we don't have a lot of. So and they, yeah, I, yeah. I think most people in you know in the metal industry probably really only know of like Guillermo del Toro the the director yeah yeah sure sure I know yeah, yeah. so actually Guillermo del Toro he filmed one of my favorite movies oh not really from, yeah he, he filmed it not far from where I'm living now so I've been there to the place where they filmed Pan's Labyrinth and stuff so I'm quite <laughs> I'm quite connected with his work you know that's interesting you know and I get that because you know uh there's certain players out there that like I connect with because of where a band is. So for example, um, I've always, uh, um, liked what Robbie Merrill has done as a bass player. Um, you know, from, and, and yeah, he's a, he's the bass play, bass player for God smack and blah, blah, blah. But from where they're from, uh, I just, I just feel like, I'm probably like distantly related to the guy because of my uncle being a Merrill also and, and from the same area. So, but yeah, that's just, uh, I totally get what you're saying. <laughs> See, we've already yeah. derailed a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so now you understand what the genesis of the, uh, of what the metal forge is. It's just metal heads getting together, bullshit talking and just having fun. I love it, man. Love it. So that's <laughs> that's how we do it. <laughs> so uh, give everybody in Metal Forge Land a rundown of Dieth. Sure. Uh, to, to make a rundown of Dieth, you mean? Yeah. Is there is there a do you have a comprehensive story or is it just uh, holy shit? All of this just happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, actually, there is a there is a. A timeline and a step by step thoughts, um, step by step process uh, into it. That yeah. it's like uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe David already told this story on the other podcast. But it's it's that uh, I had some I had some songs I wanted to to record, and I was in the process of coming back to play guitar and stuff because I've I've had a little break after some events. Um, some of them were connected to the whole pandemia thing and a lot of things that happened during that period so i i was forced to take a break and then i've chosen to to take a break for a while and then and then um i i had these songs in my in my computer in my hard drive here and i i thought that maybe putting it out and doing something would help me to to you know ignite the the rocket again and and come back to play and and so on you know and i wanted to do this with people that were maybe going through the same period as i was because for me to just join any band and start playing, I said no to like 99% of the things people asked me to do, like both musically and and to work behind the scenes with music too, you know? So few things here and there that I said yes, because I was in a position that I wanted just to do exactly what what was um, uh, what was what makes sense for me at that time, you know? So uh, when, when we decided to to make this song, I contacted Michal here in Poland. Um, I have a connection with him because I work here in Poland for a guitar company, and then I'm always here in Gdansk. That's that's where I am today, actually, in this region now. And, you know, when Michal recorded the, the, the drums for this song, I thought, like, okay, so now... Because, you know, it, it sounded pretty good with the... With the demo drums that I programmed, you know, mm -hmm. actually I have some, yeah, I have some really good drum sounds here, and then, and then the problem is that sometimes the these drums sound too good, and when you record them with the proper drums, it's not that good as the samples, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's it's kind of uh, 
It's kind of a friend of mine told me, like, man, the problem of producing too much or demos is that sometimes they can sound better than the album, you know? <laughs> you Very much. Of... Very it's funny, much. you know? And I don't know. It's kind of... Uh... It, as many bands out there that are, you know, the one person groups today that that, yeah. you, that program drums, you know, there is still a bit in the in the metal world where it's so it, it's still very, uh, very stigma driven and very. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Kind of. Um, against the grain as it were to have program yeah, drums it's sacrilegious i guess it, it's kind of like a sacrilege uh, to have program drums on metal uh, it, no man but it's in the other hand man i mean like it's for, so convenient, for writing though. for the writing i think that for the writing process man the programmed drums is something that i really advocate for at least for writing songs because it's like this saves me time uh, and energy and and everything it makes me work on better ideas because then I don't have to discuss tempo with the drummer I don't have to show shitty riffs <laughs> sometimes you have like sometimes you have a riff in your brain you're thinking about that and you want to put it out and then once you record it it's just shit man and you have to and this is one of the things about working with music and playing music is that you have to learn how to deal with the frustration that most of the stuff that you write and play sucks and you have to have like a self you have to have self indulgence to forgive yourself for being bad well <laughs> but in the other but in the other hand you have to be self critic to let only the best material go through you know exactly and, um, you know as a musician you have to have a a, a pretty good bullshit filter mhm mm mhm mm because not totally, every song like, is, it, is good it, <laughs> Yeah, man, and it's like in, in many situations in bands, studios, rehearsals, and, uh, you know, doing albums and fighting with other band members. Fighting, I mean, like, musically, discussing. Of course, not fighting, like, uh, uh, you know, in a bad way. I don't know but, some uh, the, of those bands I think that, that do it. <laughs> I, th I, think that, I think the phrase I, I most used with previous bands I was in was like, man, did you hear your song? <laughs> you know, did you hear what you're doing? Because, you know, uh, if you... It's impossible that only I hear that this is shit, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's a, it's a, it's a process that you have to go through, like to filter your ideas and stuff. So once you have the programmed drums, you can filter this and and uh, and uh, cut most of the tiring process um, that you would have with the band with hours of rehearsing together. You would cut part of that, like programming the drums, and then you listen it, you see if it works, and then you can develop that idea until you send it to the band. You know, so that's what I've done within the Hall of the Hanging Serpents. But then when Miho, uh, when I involved Dave then on the email and stuff, we were connected. Everybody heard the story already on the interviews, so I don't want to repeat David here. But you know, we were connected by a friend in the US. We got in touch on email, and David said, "Okay, send me the tracks. Let me hear the idea. Let me see what is this about." This sounds. He told me like, Guilherme, this sounds fun, but let me hear it." You know. Definitely. So, one, yeah. So once he heard the song, he was like, "Okay, so after you guys really track the drums, send me because uh, I want to track the bass together with the drums. You know, to nail all the, all the the you know the bass and the drums. They have to 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 talk and to create their own language and identity in a band. So." Because if the drum doesn't play with the bass player, and if the bass player doesn't play with the drummer, so what's the point of having a band, right? Right. So, but yeah, you have yeah. to have that. Yeah, yeah. That and interchange I, I like of the, that interchangeability between each other. Yeah, man. The division, the accent, the intention. This all has to be, you know, because on, on metal and extreme metal, sometimes we just ignore the bass and we think like, okay, man, if I just play E there, whatever is gonna sound good. And sometimes, of course, it works, but that was not the intention. I really wanted to have like a fat bass contribution, like a substantial bass contribution to the song, as far as I wanted from the drums too. And the guitars, I handle them on myself, so I know what I want from them. And that's why I always write music with, for two guitars. That's why we have a live guitar player, and we will always have, because I write two, I write distinctive guitar parts, because I think it's super boring to hear um the same thing all over again you know right and yeah yeah so so I, I i have this 
this thinking, at least for my songs, of course, I'm not saying for other people. But if you get even Led Zeppelin, man, it's like Jimmy Page, he recorded like 18 guitars on his songs, you know, because it's in studio, you have this, you have this uh, world that you can explore, this universe of production that for guitar, it's, it's amazing, man, it's infinite. It's a lot of work, but I like to do that, you know, it's, it's uh, rewarding. But then, and then, uh, yeah, when David say yes, and me hold record the drums, and the drums sounded, you know, very good, very unique. The song became, it's like if you if you would see the song becoming alive, you know. So then it was the real deal. And then I thought like, okay, so this works better than the programmed drums and everything. So let's go for it. And then David tracked the bass and stuff, and we mixed the song. And I remember listening to Hall of the Hanging, searching the car, serpents on my car, like driving. I was in Brazil when we mixed it. We mixed in Poland, but you know, the guy sent me and I was in Brazil visiting my family. I was in my car there and I, I, I really like to drive, man, blasting the sounds just to check how, you know, when you drive and, and listening to music, it's, it's, it's a good feeling, right? Yeah, I like it. It, it, it can be, yeah. uh, it can, it can be rather exhilarating. You know, when you have something yeah, that's when you have something that's that's powerful and and fast and thrashy, you know, you yeah. you do kind of put your foot on the pedal a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. And then I, I did a test. Like I went to I went to I, I was here there in the car, and I was like, man, this this fucking works. Or maybe it's been a while since I played. Maybe I'm just overexcited by this. And then I I, I called a friend of mine. Like, hey, dude, I'm passing by your house. Uh, let's go buy some beer to 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 go to visit that other guy, and then I show you some songs in the car. He said, "Oh, absolutely." So I picked up my friend Tiago. I put him in the car, and we, you know, when the whole hanging serpent start with that slow, uh, low-fi intro, you know, until the whole thing explodes. And I didn't tell him that it was me playing. I just told him, like, "Hey, man, listen to this." And then when he heard the guitar and the bass and the vocals, he just looked at me. He said, "Man, is this your new band?" <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, yeah. He said, dude, this is. He said, like, man, what the fuck? This is gonna go worldwide. Who's playing this? And then I told him it was me. How from Decapitated? This guy is a big fan of extreme metal, so he was like, fuck. And then I said, oh, and it's David on bass. And then the guy said, man, this. <laughs> so when I saw when I saw his face, then I was sure that I could send this to me. How went to David? The mix, you know. I thought, like, no, now now they can hear it because I. I <laughs> they're gonna like this and that's how it all go, went you know and then then i told david like man it was so easy to do this song it was so uh, the process was so positive and easy and, and good that i think we should do more i have enough songs for making an album and then david just sent me a message like okay man let me call you let's talk and here we are you know definitely now given the 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 group of dieth you know is there do you do you kind of feel like you're somewhat of a metal super group. Man, um... Because with your previous uh, bands that you've been in, with uh, with being in Entombed and Crow and and that stuff, and then, uh, of course, with, with David and uh, Michal uh, as well, so you've all got an extensive background in metal. Yeah, man. Um, um, I don't know. I don't know uh, if it's if it's more effective to say like, yeah, cool that we're a super group. I, I actually don't know how to answer this, but it's like we're we're a great band, man. And I I wanted to be in a band again, like a, a, a band, not only a project or or a, or a facade or you know this kind of thing. I, I didn't want to be a now now that I. I I understand the whole process we've been through. I know that I said no to a lot of work as a guitarist and so on because I didn't want to be a hired gun and I didn't want to jump on another band that has a career and then just play there. And, you know, I, I think I wanted to build something that it's meaningful and then you feel that you have the... you have the, the credit, man. You know, it's it's really... It's really beautiful to make a song and to start doing that whole thing and something super new and then people start to get it. It's like building a house, you know, when you see the whole terrain there and just and just ashes, you're like, okay, man, so you have to visualize the whole house there, you know? And then, I don't know, maybe after a year that you see like two floors, <laughs> everything in place, you know? Right. Yeah, it's great. So I, I think I, I wanted this feeling looking now in perspective. So 
I say we're a band, you know. Of course, it's a super group because we have our names and, and you know, this attracts people's but, attention. But it, it should be it should be viewed as, hey, this is what we're gonna do. This we are a band. We're gonna go out and play live. It's not just yeah. a recording project. Yeah, man, we're gonna go out and play live, and this has been one of the biggest internal discussions we have been having. Because when we started, we wanted to do like um, one thing that became another, then became another thing. And then now one of the things we're discussing is, okay, so b- because everything's on a trial basis, right? First you do one song, then you do second, then you, we, we went, of course we did fast steps, to be honest, but we went step by step with this. Right. Um, and then and then once we, we realized how this is going to work, then we programmed these concerts in June now, you know? We were going to play only grass pop just to, to to check the temperature. And then when we saw the demands on grass pop, we were like, okay, man, and so maybe let's book some gigs on the way. So we, you know, we, we test our equipment. We have new gear, new guitars. I have a new deal now with Dean Guitars. So I moved on from a guitar company. I'm using MLC amps now that I didn't use before on Entombed. So I had to, you know, it's little things that you have to adapt on the road that as much as you rehearse, man, it's never a gig, right? Right. So we had to put the band on the road and see what works and what doesn't work. And, you know, so we understood how it works on smaller places, on venues, and on a big festival like Grass Pop. And then our agent was at Grass Pop, and um, he just saw that we're we're very fit for big stages, man, because the songs, there's a lot of space on these songs. There's a lot of catchy hooks, and people love to see us together on stage because we're having a lot of fun doing it, you know. So... um, so now we now we know that we have that we have to and that we want to put the band on the road, you know. So it's another thing now that we're discussing. Okay, so how how can we put this on the road? What's the strategy? I think we should start in Europe mostly now in the beginning to do more European gigs and more festivals. And we have a lot of offers for South America. We got a a guy interested in Australia. So you know, there's a lot to there's a lot of dots to connect right now, you know. But first of all, we had to check if this works if we would like to play together because people see you on stage man and they don't get the the and i i I understand this because if you're not in a band or or in or in this type of band or in this type of situation you're never gonna understand but once i was doing a live with david and we left a a lot about it that there are some details playing a band man that nobody gets that it's like on die we were lucky enough that we like each other you know what i mean no yeah absolutely because yeah so yeah, so it's cool that at 10 a.m. when I'm going down to have breakfast, I'm like, ah, great, man. I want to tell David that I watched this uh, documentary yesterday at the hotel, and then um, I want to laugh with him. You know, this is a really good feeling, man, because I've been playing or tour managing or being on the road with bands that when I wake up and go to the breakfast, I'm like, oh, man, I have to see that guy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then i'm like oh man i have to put a smile on my face and you know be professional but inside i was like no nah. right <laughs> i mean life's too short to tour with assholes <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> so at the end of the day with die even this we had to try out because i was thinking like okay man if we play great and everything is awesome but if we hate each other I don't. I don't want to be on the road with this. You know, I was off. Yeah, you don't. And, you don't want to be all driving in the same van or yeah. or whatever if you don't like somebody. Yeah, and, and then and then you look at the tour expense, especially now. Yeah, man, and it's like <laughs> you're too close to everybody, and you know, there's all of these little details that uh, I thought with myself, like, okay, man, we have to play to try all of this. Uh, things together because you know if the gigs work and we get great and so on uh, but we hate each other uh and this is proven that you know not even if you're making a bank this is worth it because you know otherwise big bands would never split right exactly yeah Yeah, you you wouldn't have uh multiple side projects either i don't think yeah yeah exactly so i think that now now we we are no, we're 100% sure that we are a band. We're 100% sure that our focus is on this, that we're going to put it on the road, that it works on the road. And, you know, so so right now, that that's the beauty of it, you know, because we're, we're, we're experiencing, experiencing the whole thing. 
And as far as it's good for us and we're having a good time doing this, we're, we're there and we signed a contract with Napalm for more records. So, you know, we have a plan and, and um, let's go for it, you know? Hell yeah. Speaking of the record, To Hell and Back came out in early June and, you know, you're, you're pushing the 42-minute mark on it. And I think that 45 and under, I think, is perfect album length. You know, like 45 to 30. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of, like, 78-minute albums. Yeah, our album is, what, 43 minutes, 42 and a half, something, right? Something like that, that. yeah. It it says 41.59 on Metal Archives, and they're pretty accurate on that. So... But but yeah, like I said, you know, like seventy eight minute albums, they get to be super long, you know, and it uh, it almost feels like it's a chore to listen to. But when you can pop in like a thirty to forty minute album, it it's like that that I think is key. So when were you all conscious of that in the writing process? Yeah, one hundred percent, man. We were gonna make like a bigger album, actually, because we we have more songs, I think, here, or at least song ideas that they could be at least one third, or maybe depending on the quality. That I I can't tell you right now because I have to re-listen to the whole thing. You know, I've been I have this thing of record, 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 and then I just put it on my hard drive, and then I listen to it later, and I'm like, okay, this works. This this doesn't work. And a lot of stuff that I record that I think like, man, this is so horrible. How did I write this riff and thought about this shit? And then I I don't delete it. I leave it on my computer. And then, man, two months later, I listen to it like, no, 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 this is good. This works. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> because you, yes. you get to the point where, you're, where it's new again. And you're like, well, you know, maybe if I change this around, then I might have something I can work with. Yeah, and it all depends on the context, you know? It all depends on the context. It's like, you can't write... Um, I, I gave this as an example in a live I've done last week. Um, we were discussing albums and stuff, and then I said, like, you know, like, when you get a rise from Sepultura, the song Arise, that, that song is perfect, man. Mm-hmm. Th- that's the that's the perfect death trash metal song. If you say, like, tell me a death trash song that it's perfect, it's Arise. But when you listen to the album, and there's many variations on that, because if they would write 10 Arise songs, uh, Arise wouldn't be so good, because then everything gets boring and it sounds the same. So, you know, you have Desperate Cry that it's slower, you have more experimental stuff, like Under Siege, and, I think, and you'll finish with that bonus cover for Orgasmatron. So you put the waves uh, into, the, into the album, you know, and I really enjoy that. I really enjoy that in albums. Like, right. Then I thought, like, yeah, and then we die of when we wrote these songs. Uh, we had some more that, as I'm telling you, that could be like half of the next album. And then Miho called me and he said, "No, no, no, man, stop, stop, stop everything you're doing. We have 42 minutes of an album. All the songs connect. We're telling a history here. So keep these ideas for something else and let's finish producing these ones. They're good enough. It's ten tracks and they all have their own personality." And we're developing our own style on this, so let's let's focus on finishing these ones, you know. Definitely. So when you all got together to do the uh, to talk about, okay, because like you say, everything's on a trial basis. You know, you yeah. start out with a song, and songs uh, then go to well, you know, we might do we might do it for whatever, you know, like a compilation or something. That's cool. And then you say, okay, well, that really worked. Well, let's do another one and let's do, you know, and then by the time you get to the album and you're saying, all right, well, let's do an album together. And you do when, when it's, you know, when it's not your first game, it's not your first day in the game or anything like that. Do do you, are you consciously making the, the decision on, okay, we're going to put this out. We're going to put it out digitally. We're going to put it out on CD. We're going to put it out on vinyl. And then does the, then do you start thinking of like the time? Like for example, you know, you only have a a finite amount of time on a, a single disc of vinyl. I mean, so were you thinking about, Okay, well, if it goes if it goes much more past this, then it's going to be a double album. No, man, I actually I actually don't think about this stuff because I I um 
I like to delegate this part to the label or to whoever is going to be responsible for this. Because if we wouldn't be signed with a label or something, we would release this somehow. I don't know. You know, uh, there's always a way to put music out. Right. But w- w- my my focus, it's like uh, I'm very practical with my my working hectics and logistics, you know. It's like logistics for me, they are the, the key word for for the band and um, what I like to focus is write enough good songs I, I mean like there's not even a term like there's not in, never enough good songs but my, my point is write 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 songs and if if next album and I write a song that is nine minutes and I'm singing opera and David is playing violin if we like it so be it we're gonna have a nine minute song there you know so I think that the riffs they speak by themselves you know Definitely. And yeah, and I think that if you program yourself like, okay, is this gonna fit on a vinyl? Is this gonna be this or that? Then then you're then you're not gonna write music, man, because you're gonna be already limited, you know? Yes. So it's like there is a really good documentary about the egos, because I, I fucking love Joe Walsh, you know, as a guitarist. And it's really cool because Joe Walsh was this guy that he started with this whole madness of being a crazy rock star in the sixties and seventies, right? Breaking hotels and and getting super drunk and stuff and i really enjoyed listening to his stories you know and uh, i seen that when he entered the eagles people were like man joe is a little bit too much but then the guy said like yeah man but we need this rock and roll guy here <laughs> you know definitely so yeah and then they did hotel california and there is an interview with the producer that they called the radio station and the radio station said man this song is seven minutes it should be four i don't know the radio station responsible at the the somewhere or the producer and then the label but for but back then for them to have access to the song the guy had to send the tape and then the the producer he said like man i don't care this song is something else this solo is fabulous and i don't care if this song is seven minutes you're gonna play seven minutes on the radio do it once and tell me what happened and they did it and you know man you know everybody knows what hotel california is so what I mean is, if they would have cut this to fit on a radio uh, format or, you know, to fit on a 7-inch, to be 4 minutes and stuff, maybe we would miss the biggest solo in music, on rock music, you know? Oh, yeah. The coolest. The... Yeah, so, you know, so get Hotel California, man. It's a 7-minute song that got this big. It's because they didn't compromise the sound or the record or their musical options uh because of formats you know and i i love this story about the this song you know definitely and it, and yeah and, and i think it's the same for like rush so i think they they did the same thing with like working man and and they and nobody wanted to play it because it was like a seven minute song and then all of a sudden the station in like cleveland started playing it because the dj had to use the restroom yeah man and it's like and if you get like, uh, uh, um, you know, man, Black Sabbath, um, Warpix is what seven minutes as yeah. well, uh, almost and eight, I believe. Yeah, almost eight minutes at the end of the day. Yeah. So if you get like, if you get even even um, if you get even Megadeth, man, Holy Wars, you know, it's almost seven minute song, and it's it's something that you 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 don't stop Holy Wars in the middle of the song because it's more than four minutes, right? And if they didn't play the radio, I, I don't think that compromised Megadeth's success, you know. So this thing of thinking about the formats, I, I don't I don't believe in that, you know. Definitely. <laughs> Sleep till 
In a time of madness and deceit, its coming was foretold. And now, Soul Grinder has returned to become Building Crusher. From the band who brought you the prophecy of blight comes a terrifying new chapter that will leave you changed forever. This summer, dawn the armor of atrophy. Let plasma crush away and become now bound to burn. So awesome, man. Uh, we're going to go ahead and switch over to the derailed segment here. This is five random questions. Uh, anything goes. You, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, what invention could you not live without? Hands down, couldn't live without. Man, what invention I couldn't live without. <laughs> Man, nowadays I think like, how would we tour so much without an airplane, right? So, <laughs> and so you know, airplanes, I think they help us a lot. Us touring musicians, we need them, you know. Right. That's a, that, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, an airplane... <laughs> Well, because Man, I, that, was, that, I, was that, having, that, I was making a, a joke with a friend of mine. Well, no, uh, but was... but that actually makes good sense too. Because you're currently, by the time we're recording this, you're in Poland, but by yeah. way of Brazil, right? Yeah, man, and I live in Portugal, and I fly to Brazil a lot, and half of my life is here in Poland. I have even like a room here with a half of. I bought like a wardrobe that I live here locked with my <laughs> stuff, so I don't have to travel with suitcases and shit. Right, so, uh, that would just, much, that's just a pain in the of, ass. Yeah, man, but it's like half of my life nowadays is in airports and stuff. And I was talking to a friend of mine, a good drummer, and she, <laughs> and I was telling her like, man, imagine the time we spend in airports and planes. If we would be playing our instruments, we would be playing as good as Mozart, right? <laughs> Probably so. Uh, you're and not then wrong. She said, and, and then she said like, yeah. And then I told her, yeah, but why Mozart plays like Mozart? Because he was not touring. <laughs> Exactly, so, because he had no he, was, he had nowhere to go. Yeah, he was not spending time <laughs> on airplanes. So <laughs> that's great. So that's one, yeah, so I think that's one of the inventions we couldn't live without. You know. Uh, yeah, for sure. So the, yeah. you know that's got to be uh, that's got to be an interesting dynamic. So you said you in Poland, you know, you have a wardrobe that you keep locked up when you're not there. Do you have a, do you have a guitar that you that's that stays there? And you have one that stays, you know, the at the main stay in Portugal, or and do you have stuff in like a guitar in Brazil that you keep at just there, so you know that you don't have to travel with an instrument too. But uh, that's really funny because it's like when I moved from Stockholm, man. Uh, actually, I still have three guitars there that I don't know what to do with them because you can send them to, to me. No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll do that. Yeah, I have, I have to keep some stuff in the West, but now that I'm with Dean Guitars, they have enough guitars in the West for me, so I don't have to send guitars there. But it's funny because I have three guitars in Stockholm. I'm going to take them out of there one day. I'm saying this for the past two years since I moved, but, you know, it's going to happen. It's at my friend's place. And I have my gear here in Poland together with my, my stuff that I told you. So here is our headquarters and stuff because our drummer is from here. So I leave my stuff with his stuff, the Diaf gear, so to say. So my pedal board and my, my case with my two stage guitars, they stay here. And in Portugal, I have two guitars and my acoustic guitar and some other gear that I use to record. So I, I keep that in my room there and um, there's a studio my neighbor, now my neighbor has a rehearsal room near my place where I go there and I do some work too for myself. I record some videos and so yeah. And then in Brazil at my at my place there, I have like a, I have a, an interesting Stratocaster there that I when I go there I practice a lot on them on that, um, especially because the guitar has some lace single coil pickups. Ooh. So they're so they're very different from everything I do here so it's great when i'm there that i play other stuff i try other chords i try clean sounds and i really like the neck pickup sound from strats 
so I can compose things there. And I have more, one or two more Dean guitars there in Brazil. So it's great that I can always fly just with a backpack, you know, because at my place in Brazil, of course, I have, you know, countless, uh, you know, clothes and stuff. And, and here in Poland, too. So everywhere I go, I just have my guitar ready for, <laughs> for war, you know. It's 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 all ready to go. All you got to do is just plug it in, right? <laughs> yeah, man, plug and play. <laughs> there Straight you go. to the amp. <laughs> that's awesome. That that's so cool. So, uh on a on the related topic of that, I do want to ask, uh off the top of your head, how many guitars do you own? So, let me see. Two, four, six. Okay, if you already have to count, it's a lot. <laughs> Because I sold one, so I and one guitar of mine in Sao Paulo, I kind of lost it because I don't know with who it is. Since oh I moved. no! But this guitar, it, it was my first guitar, man. And the, the neck is broken, and I don't think it's gonna ever be uh, uh, back again. I mean, I know my friend has it somewhere, so let's not count this guitar. But I think I have like ten or. 11. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, I think at one time I had like I think I had sixteen, and that was guitars and basses. And yeah, they all sound different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and I said to anybody who's dating a musician, uh, they all do sound different. So, you know, <laughs> it's not a, it's not a thing. It's not like new shiny thing. Sometimes it is, but not always. <laughs> not always. <laughs> uh, what do you think most people take for granted today? Man, it's not only one thing, right? But I think we take for granted um, our health. You know, we take that for granted, and I and I think that this is um, this is something we can never take for granted. Our health is the first thing, you know. Right. I mean, no, yeah. I think you're absolutely right with that. Health uh, health is a big thing where people take it for granted and don't, you know. The the scientists are experts for a reason. Because they've put in the time and the research, right? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was, uh, I had a surgery um, after after LG passed uh, passed uh, in 2021. I had I had like a lot of transition moments and stuff, and I started to feel super bad. And I found out that I had to to do a surgery too. It was nothing super complicated, but you know, it was the kind of surgery that was an internal one. So I had to stay like 40, 45 days in bed, you know, oh, wow. and that. Yeah, and that and that kind of messed up with me. Of course, it messed up with you uh, to be forty five days in in bed because you know, man, your brain is still super active, but you can't move much. And some surgeries for you to heal one hundred percent the internal stitches, <laughs> you have to be quiet because if you move too much, they can break. Right? So there is, it's normal. That's what you have to do. Yeah. And that that. And that gave me a lot of perspective because, you know, when I was in, in Brazil, because I've traveled there to do the surgery because I wanted to be near my family and stuff to get some help and so on. And um, a lot of people were asking me. And then and then I just realized, man, that on this so-called business, people ask you all the time about, you know, your new goals, your new label, your this, your tour, your blah, blah, blah. People, people uh, uh, they, they don't care if you're even alive, man. And also people want people to do uh holograms tours and stuff and for me it's like man come on you know so uh when i when i was in bed i really put this in perspective like and people were asking me what are were my next goals in my life and in my career and i said like man i don't have goals my goal is to be good to be healthy is to be in a good shape and then if i'm in a good shape and i play in a band amazing right then the band is gonna go well but if i'm in a super bad shape playing a big band, man, it's still going to be bad, right? Right. So, if, because if only the career perspective would give you all the answers, you would never have big rock stars depressed, right? Absolutely. And, yeah, yeah. it is a health issue at, at that point. Because, yeah. you know, and, and I think that's what a lot of people just don't pay attention to. You're absolutely right. That, you know health makes a difference you know and and not only is it just from your from your mentally how it affects you you know if you're in bad health you know you you just oh man i don't want to do this and you know and then that does affect so hell yeah yeah that's an awesome answer 
Great, great. Yeah. Next one. Uh, what mode of transportation do you believe will be obsolete within the next 20 years? Dude, wow. Actually, nowadays, things move so fast, man, that anything that I say here, any prediction, uh, you know, maybe in five years is going to sound just completely nonsense, you know? So, I really don't know, man. <laughs> but, it, uh, but in the other hand, it's like, man, people started to criminalize stuff. You know what I mean? Oh, like, like, like people who uh, ride bicycles. Yeah, man, and it's like, dude, this nonsense with, like, you know, uh, uh, being ashamed of flying planes. There was this thing that happened when there were certain campaigns. I don't want to say names and enter on this because, you know, uh, I don't want to go there because I don't have time for that right now. But it's like, nowadays, airplanes, man, they're super well developed. It's clean. Oh, it's right. clean uh it's clean gas and uh, you know man you put the gas there and it comes uh, a gas that filters the air for the birds and everything is great and people are still like you no know, criminalizing like if it's wrong for you to take a plane and you know cars nowadays they're electric they fluctuate they they go you can put them on the water and and they make coffee and it's and you know it's great so i don't think it's going to be obsolete to jump on a plane or to have a car or to have bigger ships i think that the that the sources of energy they're going to get cleaner they're going to get more powerful and and people are going to learn more how to work with better radioactive elements in a safer way because you know man a little 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 bit of um nuclear fuel can fuel like a town for a year and and you know and that at the end of the day is not you're not destroying rivers or something to do that and then and then when you say this kind of good achievements that we do as human beings nowadays people criminalize that as if oh my god you like cars oh my god you used benzene it's like dude no grow up it's uh it's uh would you like to be in a horse still you know <laughs> so, i don't know you know, i like horses though no, <laughs> i'm kidding <laughs> you no know, you know and yeah if you ride no, horse, you're absolutely you right but uh, then if you ride horse you're exploring the animal and then i can't get in problem because i said this so you know, right i don't well, i don't think there's gonna be anything obsolete man it's just that people are gonna develop smarter ways to transform energy that has been yes what human beings what human beings has been doing since forever and, you know, with the Industrial Revolution, we just got better and better at it. Definitely. I think uh, I think the things that will be obsolete will... And, and and it might be companies that are uh, uh, obsolete to a p certain point, like Delta Airlines. I, I'm just saying, using it as an example, I have no insider knowledge here. Or, you know, something like an Uber. It, we're going to just transition to the next phase of... Okay, like Spirit Airways, you know, they're a new line, a new airline company. You know, I think that's where it's going to be. I don't think you're. it's going to be an obsolescence as much as it's going to be a transition of company more so than yeah. anything. Sure, sure. And of course, man, if we, if we invent some sort of, you know, wormhole and all this science fiction that we have, we were reading and watching this since forever... Uh, if this comes to a to a to a reality one day, then of course some stuff are going to be obsolete. But yeah, how absolutely. We so then yeah, that, well, how that's a nice hypothetical question that I will throw in as number four because it continues on our our conversation here is um, if if teleportation was like say it came out on the market tomorrow and. You know how how the testing and shit like that goes. Would you still would you do it? Man, uh, uh, um, I think so, man. I mean, like, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I would wait for people to test this. A yeah, lot it of can't times, be like so the I, Manhattan Project. <laughs> yeah, I, so I see how many people disappear, how many people disintegrate, and then you start making your risk yeah, or somebody, <laughs> or like I said, it can't be like the Manhattan Project where the ship disappeared and people, and it, and it reappeared, and people were in the walls and shit, or halfway in the walls and shit like that. No, <laughs> yeah, no, so, you know, can't I do would, none of yeah, that shit. I would wait. 
yeah, I wait for people to try that, you know, to a safe point, and then I could jump in. You know? Right. <laughs> but yeah, I think that I think that would be amazing. Imagine what you talk about what it would be like for touring. Oh my god. Oh, dude, that would be a dream. You man. could do Tell me about it. you could do two shows a night if you wanted to. <laughs> oh yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, play an hour set in LA, teleport to, you know, to Phoenix and play another hour set. You know, that that could be cool. Yeah, but imagine man, you play in LA and then you teletransport to New York and then you sleep at your place after the gig. Imagine that. That that would be yeah, be imagine yeah, imagine yeah. being able to go home after every show and sleeping at home. Yeah, well, that would be a torture for many people that they use tour to get out of their houses. But yeah, right. <laughs> <you know? laughs> That's great. Yeah, so that would fuck up a lot of marriages, you know. <laughs> she's like, why or he? Why won't you just go away? Uh, <laughs> go it's back your, on tour. It's, it's her only chance to get rid of your husband, and then he goes to play, and he comes back and sleep with you. So, oh my that gosh. Would, that would that, be that's that for great. A lot of people, you know that that's such a. You're absolutely right. It would probably trash a lot of marriages in the industry. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure of it, dude, Guillermo. Uh, uh, I have one more question, but before we do, as always, links are listed below, so please give a like, a share, and a follow. Go find uh, where to buy this album. I'm pretty sure you can get it anywhere, and especially on the links that I'm listing below. Do you have any shout-outs you want to give today? Yeah, man. Uh, was, you mentioned about the links. I'm quite sure we have like a link for the Napalm US store, so... Um, yeah, I believe if people if people are curious where they can acquire our material and follow us, follow the links and find the U.S. store uh, uh, link there and grab our album to Helen Beck. Definitely. See, I all, I always put ban, uh, links to like Bandcamp and the homepage and the Metal Archives. So everybody, you know, and the Metal Archives links everything on there. You know, they even list like official and unofficial places they list labels so yeah definitely so i'm sorry i interrupted continue with shout outs perfect man uh yeah and um last thing here the last shout out it's is to say thank you very much for everybody that has been supporting us um through this through this um whole campaign here because what, what is funny about diet man is that this project is so positive and, and powerful in many ways that i think that people were getting contaminated with our vibe and i don't recollect the last time i've put music out that it attracted so many people and everybody was so positive and when i say positive it's not the, only the press or the the labels and people in the industry it's the the people itself that listens music are giving us a feedback that is phenomenal you know so i would like to say thank you very much and and vamos man let's do this hell yeah uh, i think what it is is the music industry puts out so much content and it is hard for independent bands to get recognition and get noticed and as it is already you know as it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago how you know how the the big ramp up in in you know playing in music uh playing bands and stuff like that and playing in music and it's even more so today because the, com the the population of the world is so much more. So I think with with things like that is, you know, it's it's a lot harder to find good, interesting music that's not just constantly put out by the labels, like the major labels, like the Sonys and the you know, the the labels like that. That when you do find a gem like Dieth, like you know uh, Night Demon, like Haunt, like bands like that, that you really latch onto, and you're like, "Holy shit, this is really good." And then, and yeah, I think that's where you know, you know, that's where things like Bandcamp and this podcast and all these other independent. Um, uh, news outlets that are not like the loud wires and 
and the decibels and stuff like that, which are great to have, don't get me wrong, but, you know, it, it gives a voice to everybody. Yeah, sure. Definitely. So, final question of the day. If you had yes, to be sir. haunted by a ghost for the rest of your life, but you could choose which dead person would be the ghost to haunt you, who would you choose? Dude. <laughs> that's a good one. Well, no, that's a good one. That's something I never thought about ever in my life. Do you believe but, uh, in ghosts, first thing? Man, I don't know if I believe in ghosts, but I believe in energy and spirituality, and uh, I think that that uh, there is a dimension to our senses. Because, look, we we calculate and we scientificized, I don't know if it's the right term, but we, we got to scientific names and terms to what we feel on our on our skin, to our vision, our our the smell and stuff we we put names on this like 150 years ago and i think we have like a sixth sense that connects us to something else that we still didn't find the right way to name it you know for sure so i believe yeah so i believe that our conscious and your matter your particles and stuff once you die you you know your matter is still here and most probably you're gonna become something else maybe you reincarnate on being a human being again maybe you'll do something else i don't know so I believe, yeah, I believe there are spirits there and, and, you know, they communicate and stuff. Somebody recently on the show had said, uh, and I think this is great, this is an amazing way to look at this, is if you equate it to like a radio and you've got, of course, the on and off and volume knob on one side, but then you've got the, the tuner on the other and, you know, Maybe I'm just not tuned to that frequency or something like that is what he had said. Exactly. And it's exactly. like, wow, that is totally cool. And I, and, I, and I heard that and it's like, and it's like, it's like mind blowing, you know, it like made me think of it in a completely different light. Like, so who would you pick to haunt you? <laughs> dude, dude, I mean, like, I mean, like there's. You're, There's you're so many, this and I'm just thinking. I was thinking, like, man, who I would like to hunt me? Because you know, Julius Caesar, man. You know, imagine you have a Roman emperor giving you advices on the radio when you turn on the volume. That would be amazing, <laughs> man. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I like he to... he met a he met a a bad uh, end, didn't he? I mean, yeah, he had a super bad end. So that's that's very. That's uh, he would have awesome advice. It's like, man, don't trust people. They stab me in the back. So take a look at <laughs> <Right. laughs> so take a look at this and stuff. And you know, when I crossed the Rubicon, you know, it was this, 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 and that. So get your ass off the chair and go to the fucking gym. You know, I think Julius Caesar would be awesome for me. That would be cool. I, I, yeah. I get, I could totally get behind somebody like what you said. He's like a, he, he's a, a, a motivator. <laughs> <laughs> He'll get yeah, you going. Yeah, yeah. He'll you know, like, you know, like, get your ass yeah. out of the chair. Go to the yeah. gym. <laughs> I will show. Yeah, I would show him like some kickboxing movements and ask for you know for, for some gladiator moves as, as as tips. So it would be fun, man. That would be fun. That would be know? funny. That that that's awesome. And yeah. and I'm sure no one else would see see Caesar. Only you. Only you could. And it, so it's almost kind of like a quantum leap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I would love to ask him the real story about Cleopatra because now it's on Netflix and everybody's asking about that. You know, we could chat. And <laughs> You know, that is so – that's wild that you bring that up because yeah. I was over at one of our sponsor's shops, uh, Electric Ladyland in Louisville, and they're a um, – they're a head shop here. They do CDs and DVDs and records and all your, you know, like the metaphysical stuff, like the, 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 the stones and, you know, the stuff like that and the sage and the incense and the, and the, the, uh, vaping products and the smoking products and stuff like that. Right. And in the, in the DVD bins, there was the Elizabeth Taylor, uh, movie of Cleopatra 
And I was just like, ah, you know, it's like, this is a really good copy of it. I'm going to get it. I've never seen it. So I bought it. It was like six bucks. And yeah. So you brought up, you know, Caesar and Cleopatra now that it's on Netflix and everything. It's like, wow, that's kind of a, you know, uh, kind of ties in with my life a little bit right now. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a uh, hype now. So, you know, then I, I would be on point with all the chats and talks at the bars and everything, you know, hell yeah. You would be up, you yeah. would, you would be in the know and nobody would really they'd be like, what, how do you know that? And it's like, well, he's, he's kind of just telling me, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man. Awesome. Guillermo, thank you so much for coming on the metal forge this week this has been a blast i have had such a great time talking with you um on our way out today from to hell and back what are we gonna play man so let's go for something different i would play um free us all awesome yeah. so you heard him from the band dieth this is free us all
in 2017, one man's vision and passion for all things metal started out as a record store in his house. Years later, the fight against a mainstream empire continues as Shade Beast. An independent metal collective and online store based in Athens, Georgia, is the world's premier heavy metal brand for music heads that value authenticity over the mainstream acceptance. Featuring original t-shirts from some of the best underground artists, as well as stickers, posters from the Shade Beast Presents concert series. Unique, one-of-a-kind collectibles and small curated selection of vinyl and cassettes from the masters old and new. Visit ShadeBeast.com and enter promo code SITHLORD for free domestic shipping on your first order, whether you're a new customer or returning. And be sure to join the Shade Beast social groups on Facebook and the interwebs to keep up with the new release announcements and talk all things metal and Star Wars. You'll never find a more wretched hive of scum and filth. Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Since 2013, there has been a calling from the underground, from the graves of all those unholy, and they decided to make a zine to talk about all of this. Soul Grinder Zine! an independent metal zine to keep you informed on all things metal and horror from the underground. Available in both print and digital formats, they're bringing you the best interviews and reviews out there today. Not only do they do the zine, but they also do compilation CDs. Check them out at facebook.com slash soulgrinder.zine and start your subscription now. Hey everybody, let me tell you about the new sponsor to the Metal Forge, Unchained Tapes. They're an independent Pennsylvania tape label. They focus on extreme metal and punk with a killer approach to the tape scene. Visit their web store at unchainedtapes.bigcartel.com now to get your fill of tapes. And for being a Metal Forge listener, enter the code METALFORGE10 at checkout to get a 10% discount on your total purchase. That's unchainedtapes.com. BigCartel.com What's up, Metal Forge fans? This is Alan Bishop, the alchemist of Indiana's Black Forest and head distiller at Spirits of French Lick. Do you find yourself drawn to the unexplained, fascinated by the Fortean, or enchanted by the paranormal? If the things that go bump in the night resonate in your mind, then tune into my brand new podcast, If You Have Ghosts, You Have Everything. Featuring first-hand accounts, collected stories, interviews, history, and speculation related to all things not of this world. Available now on Anchor, Spotify, Google, Amazon, and more. Set back, relax, and remember, if you have ghosts, you have everything. Thank you.
Hey, let me tell you guys about Mercenary Press. They're an independent London label and distributor of all things metal. Mercenary Press delivers the goods from their own independent zine. Trust me, you're going to want to get in on that. To distributing various bands from all over the world, including Cramp from Spain and Sadistic Force from Texas. Visit mercenarypress.bigcartel.com to find out what all they have in stock and what you can order. And for Metal Forge listeners, enter code MetalForge10 to receive a discount on your total purchase at mercenarypress.bigcartel.com. Check it out now. Hey, Metalheads, it's with great pleasure I get to tell you guys about a new sponsor to the Metal Forge, Ageless Art, New Albany. After 20 years of owning and operating Ageless Art in Clarksville, Indiana, Phil Garrett had a vision for a new type of tattoo studio, something that is clean and modern, sleek, refined, inviting. And he's done just that with Ageless Art in New Albany. You can find it at... 2736 Charlestown Road, New Albany, Indiana, 47150. Business hours are Monday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Sundays are 12 to 6. All sessions are appointment only, so give them a call and go get you some new ink. Or if it's your first time, go get your first one, baby. Maxwell's House of Music in Jeffersonville, Indiana, is the premier 12,500 square foot music superstore that has served both Southern Indiana and Louisville, Kentucky metro area for over four decades. Originally founded by Marvin and Beverly Maxwell in the 70s, this gym remains a Maxwell family-owned business. Mark Maxwell, along with his business partner, Whitney McNichol, continued the reputation as being the national resource for all things music. In 2022, the iconic Guitar Emporium of Louisville relocated to Maxwell's Music, creating the largest independently owned showroom in the region. The retail offerings at Maxwell's Music includes a huge selection of guitars, basses, amplifiers, effects pedals, modeling amps, keyboards, drums, banjos, mandolins, ukuleles, sound systems, stage lighting equipment, and accessories. The music education program at Maxwell's is second to none. From private instrument and voice lessons to DJ, EDM, recording, songwriting, and music theory, to rock school, weekend warriors, and Maxwell's Music Lab, there is something for every age and every ability level. Down in repair land, guitar and instrument repairs and refurbishment are taken care of by the Maxwell's team of expert guitar technicians and luthiers. They also do appraisals of instruments as well. Maxwell's offers installations for professional audio, visual, and lighting systems for schools, churches, clubs, VFWs, funeral homes, sports fields, and so much more. There's also rentable space at Maxwell's, from the music practice and rehearsal rooms for the individuals and bands, all the way to a meeting space and concert venue that seats up to 120. That also includes a professional audio, visual, and lighting system and a sound booth. Maxwell's has it all. All this plus original functioning 1947 recording booth to make your own record. Go to the Guitar Hero Throne, to the very own Elvis statue, and don't forget the Harmony Green Pocket Park. There's a reason the Maxwell's House of Music in Jeffersonville, Indiana has been recognized by the National Association of Music Merchants as a number one award-winning best store design, as well as top 100 music store year after year. You gotta see it to believe it. Maxwell's House of Music in Jeffersonville, Indiana. (laughs) 